Kentucky basketball has a big rivalry game this Thursday against Louisville and Kenny Payne, but could this be the final game of Coach Payne's Louisville tenure? You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dahl, writer for Sports Illustrated for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. You can go to prizepicks.com slash locked on and use code locked on for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks. Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. On today's episode of Locked on Kentucky, we are going to be having the conversation about Kenny Payne and the Louisville Cardinals right now not doing so well. Could very well be the final game of Kenny Payne's Louisville career. Going to talk about that as well as give you an update on the Kim Palm ratings and the net ratings because we did not get a chance to do that in our previous episode. So thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen. Every single day, I want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. If you're listening on podcast, I would appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. The Louisville Cardinals have not had a very good start with Kenny Payne as their head coach. Obviously, we all know what happened last season with the 4-28 and disaster that were the Cardinals. Could not do essentially anything on either end of the floor. In fact, if you want to go and look at their Ken Palm uh, page on uh, the Ken Palm website, you can take a look at this, uh, at this uh, horrid <laughs> statistical uh, nightmare that were the Louisville Cardinals a season ago. If you don't know how Ken Palm works, you will see... Uh, a bunch of different statistics on the left side of the page. You will see on the right side their schedule, wins and losses, and then different numbers within that accordingly. But if you look on the we- the, the left side where all of the statistics are, it will show you the number that you're looking at, whether it be field goal percentage or more advanced things. And it will show you the number, where that ranks nationally, and then it will be given a color. And the brighter the green, the better the uh, the ranking is nationally, obviously. And the deeper the red, it can shift to uh, red or more of like a, a, a tan color if it's in the middle uh, between green and red on the website. Um, the, but, but the more red it gets, the worse um, the, the number is nationally. And if you look at Louisville uh, this past season, they have so many different blocks of statistics that are just either bright red or close to turning pretty red. It is, uh, it's shocking how bad uh, Louisville was a season ago and also I'm just now noticing that they were 12th nationally in average height per player um, so that's really funny that they couldn't get anything going despite actually having some legitimate height <laughs> um, but Louisville uh, this past year uh, they made it a little bit of a contest for a minute against the Wildcats of course Kentucky ended up winning that game I believe it was like 86 to uh, to 62 63 uh, was the final score in that one there were I think at no point during this first season of Kenny Payne's career were there any like bright spots of, oh, well, maybe this could be turning around next season because of X, Y, or Z. Obviously, Payne has the reputation as a recruiter, and he's been continuing to try and recruit uh, at Louisville, obviously getting uh, Knox, uh, Carter Knox, uh, potentially uh, on campus here pretty soon uh, with the Cardinals. He might have already visited, actually. Um, but he has not really done a whole lot to impress when it comes to coaching the Cardinals. Now, he could go elsewhere at some point in the future, and he could find success there. I'm not saying that this would be a career-ending uh, a career ending of potential firing that could be happening. But if you go and look online, this isn't just something that people are speculating over of, okay, when is Kenny Payne going to finally get the boot? Four, uh, four and twenty-eight last year. Started the season five and six. They already have more wins than they did a season ago, but they have a pretty confusing, uh, a couple of pretty confusing losses on the schedule to DePaul, 
on the road, Arkansas State, and then early in the year, they lost to Chattanooga, only beat UMBC, who is ranked 328th in the Ken Palm ratings. Uh, they only beat them by one point at home to begin the season. So not a whole lot of positive things going on for Kenny Payne. If you go online, you'll start to see some rumblings about, okay, could this be a spot where Louisville moves on from Payne and and this game could be very well it. According to Matt Norlander of CBS, after speaking to sources, he indicated Payne is unlikely to be fired before the team's game on Sunday against Pepperdine, which did not happen, but that it is expected to happen before the end of the season. With a long gap between December 21st and Louisville's next game, January 3rd at Virginia, Payne's dismissal um, could be coming soon. That That is from Andy Patton, writer at Wildcats today, alongside myself. Uh, if you go and look, you can see on Cardinal Authority, uh, which is a 24-7 uh, sports website for Louisville, you can see this breakdown that Matt Norlander has about Kenny Payne potentially being let go between these two games if uh, if he does end up losing to Kentucky, um, even if he doesn't end up losing to Kentucky. Actually, I don't know. I don't think they could fire him. Uh, if he somehow miraculously pull this, pulls this one off. But this is not a good spot. It's just simply not a good spot for Payne and Co. And there is a world here where it very well could happen. Now, like I said a second ago, I don't think that if he gets let go, and it's looking, it's trending towards him being let go at some point this season. If he does get let go, I don't think that this is a career ender for him. Certainly not. But it, it, this, is, this, this, this has not worked out the way that both Louisville and Payne anticipated it going. And I understand that you bring some things to the table with the recruiting aspect, um, but it is just the product on the court at times has been absolutely horrid. And something that I will say about this team, the way that they operate this season, you cannot sustain offense going to the foul line and making that what you are, especially if you're as bad as a team as Louisville is. Now, teams like North Carolina... They can get away with it because they have some legitimate talent that can actually score in a variety of ways. Louisville, the way that they've relied on the uh, on the foul line so far this year, I don't think that that's sustainable, and I, I just don't know if they'll be able to pick up wins, therefore, in this ACC schedule. I'm going to pause for water here real quick because my mouth is crazy dry. Um, but, yeah, I, I just don't see this working out this year. And I think some signs start are starting to point to this being close to the end. And this game against Kentucky, if Kentucky wins, and they will be favored, and the analytics sites will predict them to win, um, it, it could very well be the end of, uh, of Payne's career. So, uh, with the Cardinals, I should say. So, if you've got any thoughts on that, if you've got any thoughts on this matchup this weekend, uh, or excuse me, not this weekend, this Thursday, between the Cardinals and the Wildcats, you can leave that in the YouTube comments below. Obviously, going to have a preview and a recap episode uh, about that, so stay tuned here on Locked On Kentucky for those episodes. I want to take a look at the net rankings uh, and then the Ken Palm rankings or ratings, I should say. Both of them are technically ratings, not rankings. I want to kind of look at those, kind of give you an idea of where the Wildcats are because they improved after that win against North Carolina. Maybe not as much as we would have expected. Before I get into that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at eBay Motors. Passion drive, and patience. It's what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are not burning rubber, or you are burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. You can keep your ride or die alive at eBay Motors. Dot com eligible items only exclusions apply eBay guaranteed fit only available to US customers. All right, continuing along here on the Monday edition of Locked On Kentucky. Lance Dahl hanging out here with you. 
Want to remind you guys, if you have not subscribed to the show already, I would really appreciate it if you went ahead and did that, whether that is on podcast or on the YouTube feed. I've really appreciated all of the love that the channel's been getting as of late on both ends. It's been awesome to see all of you guys joining up on the channel and then joining on the podcast feed. So please, if you like Kentucky basketball, then this is the place for you. Would really appreciate it if you would hop on the bandwagon. And I say bandwagon here. I don't mean like the actual bandwagon of the fan base. Of course, we're all uh, pulling for the Wildcats here, but the bandwagon of the show. So, something that <laughs> I don't know if you guys are as excited as I am about, uh, I want to dive into today. And I want to try and, 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 and talk you into why you should be as excited about these numbers as I am, if you are not already, which I, I think that you will be after we talk about these two different things. I want to start here with the more important one, the net ratings. We talked about this on a recent episode, and I will briefly recap what these net ratings are. In case you don't know, and you've heard this, me say this twice recently, the net ra ratings are a computer model that helps the NCAA Tournament Committee decide how to seed everything whenever March finally does get here, whenever Selection Sunday finally does get here. It is a tool it is not the end-all, be-all, or be-all, end-all, or however you say that. But the way the net rankings work, is or ratings, is they rank all of these different teams in college basketball. There are 363 of them. And they divide them up into quadrants. Quad 1, Quad 2, Quad 3, and Quad 4. And when you look at an individual team, their rating is largely determined, where they rank rather, is largely determined by their resume against the quad one, the quad two, the quad three, and the quad four. And you may say, well, how are the quadrants determined? I'm not going to go through every single quadrant. I'll just tell you here, the quad one, the best of the best, if you are Kentucky, for example, and you are playing a team at home, in order for that to count as a quadrant one opponent, that, uh, that team has to be ranked inside the top 30 of the net rankings. If you were playing them at a neutral site, if the Wildcats were playing that same opponent at a neutral site, they'd have to be ranked inside the top 50 for it to be considered a quad one opponent. And if you play them on the road, they have to be 75th or higher in the net rankings. Make sense? So knowing that information, we can now turn our attention to the actual net ratings and talk about where the Wildcats are. Because when this thing opened up, Kentucky was 38, 39th. And the reason that they were 38th or 39th hovering around that spot was because of that loss to UNC Wilmington. You obviously want to get wins over the best competition, the Quadrant 1 teams, but if you want to have a strong resume, you can't afford to lose to bad teams, Quadrant 3 and Quadrant 4. And obviously, UNC Wilmington, not a great basketball team in terms of resume and where they fall on the net ratings. They were a Quadrant 3 game. So Kentucky has a Quadrant 3 loss on their resume. In fact, there are actually a number of teams that are rated higher than Kentucky that have a Quadrant 3 loss. So maybe it wasn't the end of the world. But those teams also have had several more Quad 1 opportunities, it looks like. Either that or they've just straight up not lost any other games, period. Kentucky, though, the reason that they have risen in the rankings now from 38th to 27th is because they picked up a quad one win against North Carolina. That game was at a neutral site. North Carolina ranked inside the top 50 of the net ratings. So congratulations to Kentucky. They have officially gotten a quad one win. Now these wins are unfortunately subject to change. For instance, Kentucky played Miami earlier this year at home. As we stated previously, that game the, the, the Hurricanes, rather, needed to be rated inside the top 30 in order for that to count as a quad one win. As of right now, Miami is 63rd in the net rate or ratings. So uh, unless they do some major rising here over the course of the season, Miami's going to be a quad two win. Or excuse me, they're, they're going to be a, uh, yeah, it, it, it would technically be a quad two win, uh, I believe there. So it's, uh, it's a weird system that does provide opportunity to showcase how good you are against your schedule 
And it shows how good your schedule was as well by dividing all of your different opponents into these quadrants. And you want to collect as many quad one opportunities as possible. So I want to run through what I ran through on yesterday's episode briefly about the opportunities that Kentucky has to get these quad one games. Pausing for water. Again, just a really, really dry mouth today uh, doing the show. But the Wildcats, as it stands right now, have two four, They have eight quad one opportunities. Let's walk through them real quick. On the road at Florida to open SEC play. At Texas A&M, uh, the third game of the SEC schedule. At home against South Carolina, believe it or not, is currently a quad one game. At home against Tennessee is a quad one game. On the road at Auburn, at home against Alabama, on the road at Mississippi State, and at Tennessee are also quad one opponents. Right now, in case you are wondering, Mississippi State is currently ranked 41st, so they are not a quad one opportunity at home, but they are on the road. And then Gonzaga is currently rated number 39, and that, therefore, would mean that game is a quad two uh, potential victory for the Wildcats. Uh, The Bulldogs would need to be inside the top 30 again there. So Kentucky's got eight different opportunities right now on their schedule. Could grow, could shrink to get some resume-defining wins. And as we discussed previously when looking at bracketology, they've slid to that six to that five seed line. They need these wins. And then on top of that, they need to not lose some of these games against worse competition. If anything, Kentucky has to, if they take a loss, has to take a loss to one of these eight teams. Or technically, I get, no, no, it would be these eight teams. They have to be careful with their schedule and how they play against some of these teams on the road. I'm really, really curious to see how Kentucky operates in spots like on the road at Vanderbilt. Um, on the road at Mississippi State, even though that is a quad op- uh, quad one opportunity, how does that shake out? How do they play on the road at LSU? Will also be an interesting one. On the road at Arkansas, which is, by the way, not even a quad one. Uh, it may not even be a quad two uh, opportunity. I need to go look at where they, where they fall in the net ratings. But I hope I've made myself clear here. You need to... Try to beat as many good teams as possible. Don't lose to bad teams. And if you do lose to a team, make sure it's one of the good teams remaining on your schedule. And I say remaining. There's over two-thirds of the schedule left. So Kentucky's got chances. This also does not include, by the way, it does not include the SEC tournament, which would give you more opportunities. So that may end up being crucial for the Wildcats when it comes to determining where they fall in their seeding in the postseason. The, uh, the SEC tournament may be very important in, de- in deciding that. So you've got that, and then you've also got the Kim Palm ratings. And I want to go over these pretty quickly here. I don't want to waste your, your time uh, about just constantly updating you about these statistics. Um, but Kentucky, their defense, their adjusted efficiency on defense has risen nine spots nationally after beating North Carolina. They are now 44th. Um, we talked about this. Who knows? Maybe Kentucky with Aaron Bradshaw and you go back picks up significantly on that end of, end of the floor. By the way, three blocks for you go uh, in his uh, in his ten minutes that he played. Uh, very solid. The plus minus did not uh, really think highly of him, but he got three blocks in ten minutes. So he's a good rim protector. Very good rim protector. Um, Kentucky's pacing is now up to twenty first nationally. Their adjusted tempo has risen. Their average possession length on defense has shrunk nearly an entire second. Um, It is now average uh, nationally, according to Ken Palm. Their three-point percentage is still over 40%. Their adjusted offensive efficiency is still top 15 nationally. They are second in the country in turnover percentage on offense. And let's see, are there any other notes that I wanted to make here? Their two foul participation, I think Ken Palm might have messed this up because it was at 100%. For the majority of the schedule, and then against Penn, uh, after that game, it tanked to like 9.1%. I think there might have been something wrong with Kim Palm's system, because it's something that I had been harping on for weeks. And um, 
they just did not <laughs> they just didn't have uh i guess the numbers right there now it's now down to 4.5 percent is the point i want to make so it, it is whoo it is falling off a cliff and i don't think that's anything that kentucky's done and it's also not because they've added players to this rotation at least i don't think um i think kim palm might have had the the number wrong there or something like that but it is significantly underneath average uh, kentucky uh hardly playing anybody uh with two fouls in that in the first half there and then also bench minutes have this is the final point i want to make bench minutes have slightly increased from 29 and a half percent to 29.8 percent that is literally an almost like it, it almost doesn't matter there but the point i want to make here it's going to be interesting to monitor this alongside other statistics that reflect how deep kentucky gets in their bench as you go and Bradshaw get more comfortable in the lineup. So Bradshaw started against North Carolina, which is something that we speculated over as to whether or not he would start, whether or not Thierro. But now that we know that Bradshaw is going to be that number four uh, there or starting at power forward, that almost guarantees Thierro getting in the action there at the four coming off the bench because he's still a very valuable uh, piece there. He should be able to get continue to get playing time. His minutes should not fall off at least I don't think, unless Bradshaw continues to play out of his mind, I think it would be bad if Kentucky decided to just completely cut off the arrow from this rotation or cut him off significantly. He's done some really, really good things, getting to the rim, playing very aggressive defense. I love the way the arrow fits in uh, on this team. He's been a great, great uh, piece uh, for the Wildcats so far this season. But yeah, both Bradshaw and the arrow should be able to get some legitimate minutes. And then because the arrow is coming off the bench, it should uh, make that number rise. I'm also curious to see how Shepard and Dillingham are utilized in the SEC schedule. Um, it, it's going to be really telling with Coach Cal as to whether or not he has finally started to kind of back away from what has been custom for him, which is playing a very short, tight rotation and not really getting deep into the weeds. Um, whenever it comes to these more important games, whenever it comes to this SEC schedule. He's going to have a chance to play Hugo, play Thiero, play Rob Dillingham, play Reed Shepard, play these guys significant minutes coming off the bench, and let's just see if he's changed. It'll be interesting to watch. So I think that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.